thank you everyone uh, for making your time on this Thursday to come and attend this talk. So I do have a lot of slides today to go through, but the good thing is it's going to be very much visual. So just sit back and relax and kind of tune in to what the hills are about. So what protecting hills and our hills in general in Penang are about. So how I'm going to go about today is uh, I'm going to first get you to understand the hills in Penang and why we need our hills, the threats facing our hills, an introduction also the, to the Penang Hills Watch initiative and how probably you can also be a part in protecting Penang Hills. So let's first start. Okay, uh, I, I just wanted to make a note before I start off. As much as I want to cover both Penang Island and Sabrang Prai, sometimes you would see that much of the content is pretty much skewed to Penang Island. That is partly also because uh, most of the hill land in Penang are concentrated on the island. So let's look at Penang Island, hilly area on Penang Island first. So the hilly area in Penang Island is mainly granitic. And uh, the northern area where the Penang Hill, Penang Hill Range and Penang Hill Peaks are is actually called the Penang, North Penang Kutong. And while the su southern side where the Sungai Ara Hills uh, and uh, the rest of the hills, which kind of turns off to the southwestern tip, those are part of the South uh, Penang Kutong. So the main hill range on the island, if you look at this map, is almost like a backbone of the turtle-shaped island of Penang. And it runs from the southwestern tip all the way up to the northern area where it kind of fans out uh, to the northwest where the Penang National Park is, as well as the areas of Batu Peringi, uh, Tanjung Bunga and whatnot. So about 50% of the island is hilly above 60 meters above sea level. About 17% is above 300 meters above sea level. And more than two centuries of development, what has actually happened is that you see all the lowland forests, whatever lowland forest is left in the eastern portion of Penang Island has been pretty much uh, replaced with uh, urban areas and the refuge for our forest is right now in the hills, terrestrial forest. You can still have the mangrove forest in the coastal areas. And even in the hilly area, it's not to say everything is forest. If you look at the Penang Hill Range, the southern part all the way up to the middle, and even in fact, the eastern portion of uh, what we know as Bukit Bandera or the main Penang Hill area is actually very heavily uh, farmed and it's mostly agricultural land. So now going on to hilly area in Sabrang Prai. So Sabrang Prai, when you look at it from far and from this map, one thing which is clear, I reckon, can you guys see the map? Because for me, uh, the chat box kind of uh, covers up the map. Do you guys see the map, Dila? Yes, yes, we can see it okay. clearly. Yep. Yeah. All right, okay, so on the, uh, on the mainland, Unlike Penang Island, where there is a nice ridge, a backbone to the island, there is no continuous uh, range on the mainland. And pretty much what you have is clusters of small ridges which exist isolated from each other. And mainland Penang is also, wherever it's tilly, it's also mainly granitic, but you also have sandstone hills occurring in uh, the offshore islands of Pula Gedong and Pula Aman. So if you've not actually gone and seen those islands, it's quite interesting to actually see the hill formation there. It's very steep as well. And it's whatever hills that are there are only restricted to the two districts, Central and South Sabrang Prai District. Whereas in the northernmost district, which is uh, not Sabrang Prai, it is almost totally flat. And the highest peak, in the mainland is only 545 meters, uh, Bukit Mutajam. And many of the hills seem to be a mix of agriculture as well as forest. And some areas also badly denuded by uh, active quarrying operations. So now that we understood 
uh, where our hills are, uh, how the hill area is kind of distributed between uh, the mainland as well as Penang Island. We also need to know why our hills are so important. Apart from you know being the charm and the backdrop, every time for me, you know, every time I come to Penang on the Penang Bridge when I see the hills, it's almost like it's speaking to me. Oh, you know, I'm back home when I'm in the middle of the bridge itself. So apart from uh, very sentimental reasons, I think there are. Uh, I, I didn't want to restrict this to just five reasons. There's so many more reasons, but these are some major reasons I felt we could really connect to. First, of course, it's an important green lung, a water catchment area, recreational area, bio and it's important in terms of biodiversity protection and climate mitigation. So in the topic of climate mitigation, we understand that tropical forests, of which like uh, the Penang Hill area, as well as the Bukit Matajam, uh, the Sabrang Prai Hills, they are home to the Hill Diptora Cup Forest. These are important carbon sinks, which actually, actually sequester greenhouse gas emissions. So almost 200 years of colonization in Penang has meant relentless development you know, on whatever hill land, uh, I mean, sorry, whatever flat land that there has been. So the, the hills were the place where it, it kind of acted because of the rugged topography, it kind of acted as a bulwark against urban sprawl simply because the topography was just too risky and too difficult to develop. So it's too much money at that uh, time to actually develop this area. So you rather have flat land, which is more developable, developed. But of course that tide is uh, changing and we'll be discussing that uh, much later in this presentation. And when you have a large area of urban scape with a central area of fields. What that has meant for Penang people is you have a green lung right in the heart of your city. So these areas which have remained green, they have a good ecotourism as well as a uh, recreational potential for cycling, hiking. And if you notice in recent years, many of many people have uh, picked this up as uh, uh, as hobbies which they do on their weekends and one of the people that actually do this is the one speaking to you today and many of us as uh, urban dwellers one of the things that we often get ourselves submerged in is the pandemonium of city life and the green areas of Penang's hills kind of gives us not only the fresh air and the ecosystem services but also a place to unwind de-stress an important element which I believe is uh, important in maintaining our mental and physical well-being. So I always like to make this comparison between uh, one urban area and another urban area. And the, uh, the comparison that I want to make today is between Penang Island and New York. So all of you probably have heard of the Central Park in New York. And if you look at the Central Park, Okay, this is not, uh, not the entirety of uh, New York, but just a small portion of it. And you see how it comes right, Central Park comes right in the middle of all the urban scape. And when you look at how Penang Seals come uh, right in the middle of uh, a very developed eastern coast of Penang Island, as well as a fast developing western coast, you can see that in a sense, uh, the hills of Penang kind of act as the natural central park. And the thing is, our central park is much, much bigger, much, much more biodiverse, and has much, much more uh, ecosystem services to provide the people of uh, Penang. So moving on. So from that, yeah, so water catchment area. So moving on to the role of hills as a water catchment area, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of the orographic effect. So what the orographic effect is, is when air mass actually rises over high topography, it cools, water vapor condenses, and you get rain on the windward side of the hill. And because of this, every time the air kind of rises up, 
it cools and it rains, uh, hilly areas tend to have, the windward side of hilly areas tends to have higher precipitation uh, levels. So in Penang, it's almost about 20 to 30 percent more rain in hilly areas in the Penang Hill region compared to the lowlands. And one of those, uh, th that is one of the reasons that contributes to the streams that actually come radiate out of the Penang Hill Range, the Bukit Murtajam, as well as the other hills on the mainland. And most of the rivers on Penang are dendritic streams, which kind of radiate out of the hills into the lowlands. And uh, while there are so many streams actually radiating out of our hilly core, because the hills are rather small and our island is also rather small, these, this, uh, the volume of water is of course not sufficient to actually meet all the needs of the people in Penang. So about 20, less than 20% of Penang State's water needs are met by streams flowing from hills within Penang State. So this includes the hills in Bukit Murtajam as well, Bukit Murta, I mean, uh, on the mainland as well. And uh, while it's only a smaller percentage compared to the water which is contributed from Sungai Muda, it's still important. For example, some of you might be staying in places like Tanjung Bunga uh, and Batu Fringi. Most often, your water probably comes from the hills behind you. And if you are in places like Glugo, like myself, probably uh, your water comes from areas uh, uh, on the mainland, mainland meaning Sungai, Sungai Muda. And the thing is, I, I remember uh, about a year ago when we went to meet Datu Jasini, who is the head, uh, the CEO of uh, Pina, uh, per, Perbadanan Bekalan Air Pulau Pinang, the water authority in Penang. He actually said how uh, water on Penang Island, which actually comes out from the hills, has a better taste compared to the water that is extracted from Sungai Muda. And part of the reason being, uh, the moment the water actually comes out of the hills, before it hills, uh, hits the urban area, the water is pretty much extracted. After it's extracted, it's kind of uh, you know filtered and sent straight to your taps, rather than going through an urban area uh, before getting extracted, like what is happening in Sungai Muda. And about 6% of uh, land mass in Penang is gazetted as water catchment. And almost all of it, if you look at these maps, are concentrated in the hilly areas. If you notice the water catchments are indicated by the blue lines, the green area, green patches are the forest reserves. So you have two jurisdictions kind of overlapping each other in the areas of the catchment. So you see a significant amount of the water catchment is con concentrated on Penang Island specifically on uh, the northern area of Penang Island where Penang Hill is. And of course, on the mainland, it's pretty much uh, fragmented to Bukit Pancho in the south, as well as uh, Bukit Murtajam and Bukit Suraya. So these, these maps were taken from the Penang Structure Plan 2020. And not forgetting, of course, biodiversity protection. So the hills in Penang, they host a relatively mature hill diptera cup forest. And one of the uh, ways you can see a hill diptera cup forest is probably you would have noticed the uh, silvery tops of trees. Those are called the Shoria Curtisii. And when you see those uh, Shoria Curtisii, that's one of the indications of a hill diptera cup forest. And it's not to say the most mature kind of hill diptera cup forest, but a it's one of the stages just before it becomes a more mature one. And of course, at the top of Penang Hill, you have a bit of low mountain forest. And, and you also see the same in uh, Bukit Pancho State Park, where uh, you have a bit of hill diptera cup forest. And uh, this is a sentence that I extracted from the book, uh, uh, Heritage Trees of uh, Penang Island, where the geographic position of Penang kind of makes it the natural boundary for certain species. Uh, 
certain species start downward southern journey. Penang is probably the northernmost out, outpost, while species, certain species which seem to have a more northern spread seem to make Penang the southernmost outpost. And it's also worth mentioning that uh, Penang being an early British settlement and also Penang Hill as one of the earliest hill stations in Malaysia, and Malaysia and in fact the region as itself, it was also a place where pioneering botanists actually went to make collections. And because these collections were probably the first to known signs back then, they became type specimens. Type specimens are the very first uh, individual of a certain species which has been discovered. And if you look at the list published by Curtis, Ridley, many other people, many of the type specimens were actually collected on Penang Hill. And there are quite a number of endemic species which actually occur on the hills in Penang. And not just Penang Hill, but also places like uh, Bukit Pancho on the mainland. So these this four photos, uh, which I've labeled with their names, as well as the background to this slide, which shows a palm. All these five photos show species which are endemic to Penang Island. And of course, now they are pretty much restricted to the hill land in Penang. And because of this reason, partly because of the reason, the uh, significance of the biodiversity in the Penang Hill area, there has been a proposal to uh, gazette Penang Hill as a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. So I extracted this uh, map from the Habitat Foundation's uh, uh, website. And if you look at their purpose statement, it's quite clear to celebrate Penang's distinctive natural and social landscape and emphasize an ongoing commitment to achieve a balance between nature, conservation, development through sustainable use. And part of one of the other reasons why this, uh, this UNESCO Biosphere a reserve uh, nomination has been made is also in a sense the proximity of such a biodiverse forest to an urban area as well as in a sense the accessibility. So now let's go into the topic that uh, and that all of us are pretty much uh, aware of the threats which are facing our hills. So if I were to kind of uh, kind of categorize these threats into six divisions. In fact, there are so many more threats when you look at so many other things, there are so many more threats and it's not case by case where you can pretty much delineate and say, okay, this is a case of illegal farming. Sometimes there may be overlaps. But if you just look at it as a standalone, you can bring it to about six categories, which is road construction, illegal farming, quarrying, forest fires, residential construction, and also dump sites. So road construction. So one of the things that uh, road construction does is it actually pierces through the granitic terrain of the hill. And this is done through blasting, excavation work. Just because when you put a road in, you need a stable foundation before you put the road. And you also have to make sure the slopes around the road are also stable so that they don't actually cave into the road. And what that blasting excavation, what it does is it kind of exposes the granitic bedrock to weathering and, uh, and the core rock actually becomes more susceptible to you know, break loose uh, as rock falls and landslides and also landslides, yeah. So, uh, if I were to look at the impact of road construction on the hills, it's pretty immense, especially when you build uh, roads through hilly forested areas. One of the things that it does is it pretty much fragments the natural habitat. So roads being connectors for humans, it becomes an impediment for animals to actually go to the other side. And what you have is an island within an island. If you notice what has happened with the hills in the Glugo Payatrubung area, you have almost a separate range from the Penang Hill area, simply because the Payatrubung Road, 
several other roads which uh, and also a newer road which is being constructed cuts through between the Penang Hill range as well as the smaller range. So that also affects the genetic diversity of the animals that exist in that area. And I also like to call roads as a precursor to development, simply because one of the things that roads actually do is they increase accessibility. And when you increase accessibility, uh, jumping on this bandwagon of increased accessibility would be people who want to develop the area around the road uh, and promoting it based on, oh, you know, there's a road which actually links to different areas and you can use it e easier from uh, our development. Let's see. Yeah. So uh, if if we may go back to your punya road construction, we have actually okay. uh, a question now. All right. So uh, uh, from the floor, they ask what will happen if they build the cable car through the forest reserve? That is the first question. Okay. You want to take the second question or you want to answer first and then take the second question? Uh, perhaps uh, if it's okay, uh, I, I, will, I will cover that at the very end, if that's okay. I see. Uh, okay. Uh, the, the second is question. Is there one which is specifically connected to this? Okay. Uh, the second question will be Is the tunnel better than road in terms of sustainability of the hill? Okay. So maybe we'll take it uh, later. Later, perhaps. That's okay. Dila? Hello. Press it at the end. Yeah, uh, uh, let's take those uh, questions at the yeah, end. Cool. All right. Okay, so another issue facing our hills is, of course, illegal farming. And this has actually been a persistent problem which the press has covered, uh, politicians have brought up, local councillors have brought up, and it seems to be very widespread on the main Penang Hill range on the island. And uh, one thing that kind of aggravates illegal farming is also the planting of annual crops as opposed to perennial and more longer lasting as well as shading crops. Because annual crops, they tend to be, you know, within one year you have to replace them, you have to plant more and they tend to grow smaller. Uh, they tend to grow uh, lesser in a sense compared to say a tree. And because of that, it kind of exposes hill slopes to erosion. And not forgetting, of course, uh, pesticides which are used to uh, prevent the pests, those actually drain into our streams and water bodies. And in Penang, what uh, we've seen with uh, illegal farming is that, uh, in fact, many of these cases are cases of pre-existing, legally existing farms, which kind of expand beyond their lot boundaries. So you probably have a landowner which is a bit more ambitious. Uh, so he doesn't want to just uh, stay within his uh, lot and farm within his lot. So he slowly expands beyond his lot boundary. And it's not something that happens uh, almost overnight where the whole hill is cleared. It tends to happen in a cumulative process where inch by inch forest land is cleared tree by tree. And before you know it, you know, when you do something which is cumulative, it's less susceptible to be uh, highlighted. And what you get with uh, illegal farms actually going into the forest is you get forest fragmentation. So this is one example of forest fragmentation. And th this, this picture was actually taken in Penang, in uh, northern Penang. And what, what I call this forest the triangle forest, because if you see the trees, the Shoria Curtisai trees, and this is actually quite a a uh, relatively mature forest. But the thing is, if you notice the area that it covers is so small, it's uh, covered, uh, it's surrounded on all sides by farmland or orchard land. And I'm not trying to say here it's illegal to farm at the very edges. Many of these lots, I believe, are a legally existing farmland. But uh, think about it in this way. If there is wildlife in this area, do you think this forest is actually enough to sustain their necessities? Of course not. You know? it's, it's just mm. too small to sustain them. And what you get is, of course, wildlife actually encroach 
in a sense going into uh, human habit, uh, habit land as well as agricultural land and what you have as a result is uh, human wildlife conflict and yeah going into quarrying so quarrying quite similar to road construction also kind of disfigures the entire topography of the hill as a quarry in its basic sense it pretty much cuts away the whole hill you know all the raw large stones from the hill are just cut out from there and apart from uh, the weathering that actually happens when the bedrock is exposed you also have consistent blasting work done in a quarry and this also results in cracks in the hill and loose rocks in the hill which are susceptible to uh, falling and if you were to make a comparison between Penang Island and the mainland in terms of the spread of quarries is quite apparent that on the mainland quarrying is a much bigger problem than on the island not saying the quarrying uh, quarrying is not widespread on the island but is almost two times more if you look at this map compared to Penang Island and you also have to keep in mind hills on the mainland are much less compared to Penang Island so you have a higher concentration of quarries on hill land on the mainland compared to Penang Island. And just for everyone's information, uh, the thing is uh, quarrying is actually exempt from the hill slope protection guidelines which is stated in the Penang Structure Plan 2020 and 2030. And I understand it is regulated by the Penang Quarry Rules 2018. And that is also why you see many quarries actually spreading up the hill even beyond 76 meters because uh, the restriction does not actually apply to quarries and quarries are regulated by this quarry rules 2018. All right, so yeah, uh, this forest fire problem in the recent past, it was never really much of a significant problem until this year 2020. And especially I remember in the months of January and February 2020, if I remember correctly, in the months of, uh, in the month of February, in the middle of February, there were these two or three days where, you know, there were a spate of fires right from the southern side of Penang Island all the way up to Penang Hill, where, you know, multiple fires were happening at the same time. And of course, the overarching reason was also because we had a very bad dry spell in Penang Island early this year, in Penang and the northern areas early this year. But uh, it is also oftentimes a result of a trigger. Trigger meaning you have an ignition happening and the dry conditions kind of create the conditions which make the fire to spread. And if I'm not, uh, if I'm not wrong, I was just looking through an article just now where in February, even the chief minister actually highlighted uh, one of the fires that actually happened in the hills in Fire Thrubong was actually a case of illegal clearing of the land where the fire kind of spread beyond its borders. And of course, residential construction. So many uh, residents would actually know how they are facing uphill battles against uh, residential development, which is ongoing in uh, slopes which are very close to them. And this is also partly due to flatland running out on the eastern side of Penang Island. And as flatland runs out, developers actually eye the hills for residential construction, also partly promoting the idea of living close to nature, living close to the hills with a panoramic view. And ironically, this is the very idea which destroys the very nature that buyers actually look into seeing when they buy those residential properties near the hills. And it's a widespread threat on hills across the state, but it seems to be very, uh, very much a Penang Island problem as compared to uh, the Penang mainland. Uh, and if you look at areas in Sungai Ara, uh, the northern coast as well as Paya Thrubong. This is where we see a lot of residential development actually happening in uh, areas which are close to the hills, bordering the hills. And if you look 
at uh, the Penang Structure Plan 2020 as well as 2030, it's actually very clear that development on hill land above 76 meters with a gradient equal to 25 degrees or more than 25 degrees is not allowed if it's for residential, hotel, industrial, commercial development. And even then we see in, uh, cases of residential development as well as proposals, as I showed you just now, for residential development in hill areas, even though the hill slope is more than 76 meters, as well as a gradient equal to or more than 25 degrees. And when it comes to illegal clearing of the hills, we also see several cases of, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, several cases of illegal hill clearing happening. And those clearings seem to also expand. And uh, when it comes to the case of the former you know, residential development, of course, there, there seems to be a element of developer lobbying and pressure. Well, the latter case where you know the illegal clearings which are happening, it seems to be more of a reason of uh, lax uh, paltry fines, not lax laws, but paltry fines. The uh, the fine rather than kind of dissuading the offender from continuing his act, kind of emboldens him to clear more, knowing that you know the fine is so small, so don't worry about it, clear as much as possible and pay the paltry fine. And as much as we want to say monitoring is not being done enough, actually the local councils with their drones do actually engage in monitoring. In fact, they do know about cases of say hill clearing which are happening around you. It's, as I just pointed out, the paltry fines which actually act more to embolden rather than deterring. So in 2016, this was the year when we set up Penang Hills Watch. And Penang Hills Watch was started by the Penang Forum as a citizens-oriented initiative to keep watch on activities happening on Penang Hills by involving the public in reporting cases of fuel clearing and sharing this info with the government. And uh, we, the public, we, we had to realize we are usually the eyes and ears of our communities our areas, our locality. You know? And if there is a clearing or tree felling which is going around in the area surrounding us, it's probably us. We are the very first ones to actually see it firsthand before, say, the authorities or anyone else. And hence, that is why, uh, th that is what Penang Hills Watch kind of leverages upon the power of individual sightings and using this individual sighting and connecting that individual sighting to the local, in a sense, uh, supplying this individual sighting to the local authorities and push them for action. And this is how our initiative works. If you see uh, any clearing or any uh, suspicious activity happening on the hills, you see, you send us either an email or a Facebook. We used to have a WhatsApp, but we uh, don't have that number anymore. Uh, because a majority of our reports seem to come through Facebook. So he just sent us a Facebook uh, message with a photo of that clearing. And what we do is we upload this information onto an online portal. And once it's uploaded into this online portal, and this online portal is actually for public viewing, anyone can actually see it. And I, I hope someone in the committee can probably share the uh, link to the chat group right now. So if you can just click on that link, you can see the uh, cases of fuel clearing that we've uh, uh, pretty much documented over the last four years. And in, in uh, a varying um, frequency, we also send this uh, information to the Penang State Government. So it, uh, how we actually compile our reports, we have like annual reports, but apart from annual reports, we also have urgent cases where we immediately notify if uh, people tell us about a case, we immediately notify the local council for action. And yeah, so you can go to the site, you can use the categories to see uh, what kind of field clearing is happening, 
as well as the photos uh, connected with those clearings. So it's an online repository and it's to aid or in a sense uh, complement monitoring uh, activity. So what does our work involve? Of course, a lot of dialogue with government officials. So every time we send in a report, we always make it a point to meet the uh, either the exco in charge of drainage uh, because uh, floods and connected to floods, uh, the hills are also very much uh, connected to floods. So he is probably the exco we meet in order to raise our grouses. So our chief minister right now, he was actually the former uh, a former YB in charge of the exco in charge of the uh, flood mitigation um, portfolio. Right now, it's uh, I understand it's divided between YB Zairo as well as uh, YB Chakti. And we also have public awareness programs. So most of you would probably know Penang Hills Watch through the river awareness programs. So you would see that uh, hills are very much connected to the rivers because the rivers in Penang, they actually flow out of the hills. So that is the public awareness programs that we've had over the last two years. And we also, in a sense, facilitate capacity building uh, workshops. So this was one workshop that we did in 2018 in three areas, in fact, in Tanjung Bunga, in uh, Green Lane area, as well as Sungai Ara, where we uh, facilitated the Slope Watch NGO from uh, KL to come and uh, teach the local uh, residents on how to look for signs of slope failure, how to maintain their slopes. And so how can you help? I think one of the things that uh, we had to realize is when we see something you know, suspicious or uh, something like a clearing which is happening on the hills, don't just keep quiet about it. Don't just post it on Facebook. Don't just post it on WhatsApp. Make a report and report to the right authority. So you can, you can actually send it to us, but if you don't feel comfortable sending it to us, you can actually send it straight to MBPP. You know? There's an MBPP Arduan number where you can send it to. And when you report, chances are action can be taken. And one of the things when you actually report is actually brought to the attention of the local authority. Because sometimes you also have to understand that uh, the local authority, when it comes to actually monitoring all the hills, every inch of land, it may be something which is a gargantuan task. So we have to, in a sense, be proactive citizens. If we see something suspicious happening in the hills, do our part in reporting. And if you are a com community where you're staying in a hill slope area and the next thing happens is, you know, there's a hill slope project which is happening near you, show your opposition. Don't just keep quiet and don't just, you know, oh, it's going to happen. So uh, let's just live with it. If you don't like it happening in your backyard, in your state, you have to show your opposition. And I, I would like to commend the Sungai Ara community. You know? They've stood very firm in opposing that uh, hill slope project, which is uh, um, being proposed behind their backyard. And also civic consciousness. So in a sense, this was one point which I did not touch as a threat facing our hills. But if you look at many of the trails today, one of the things is it's littered with a lot of rubbish and uh, a lot of trails are also being constructed in areas which which are already dense with trails. And when you have so many trails which are cutting through the forest, that also kind of fragments the forest. So there needs to be civic consciousness among hikers to keep the trails clean, to not create new trails in places where there is already a density of trails. These are things that actually come with understanding nature. And yeah, so that kind of brings me to the end of my presentation. 